Thank you, um, Sean. And, um, well, I think so far every speaker has talked about the transparency issue. It's been kind of a, a theme, um, and the moderators. So I think that uh, uh, I just want to express a lot of frustration in this. I can't believe that the U.S. Congress, the House and the Senate, the President of the United States, and the press corps are so complacent to the corporate demand that all these negotiations be done in secret. Recently, there was a FOIA request that we had where we asked for the communications from the cleared advisors, the USDR, some of those six or 700 Washington, D.C. insiders who have privilege access over taxpayers and voters, citizens, the people around the world affected by the agreement. And we asked for, you know, uh, the communications that people had on the intellectual property issues on the, on the committee that deals with intellectual property. And the contents of all the messages, we got like, you know, the, 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 the messages, but the, the contents were all deleted because they were shielded from FOIA. Now, if anyone in this room, if you're not on one of those advisory boards, writes a letter and asks a government official to do something, that's normally subject to disclosure. So you can see if the agencies get, you know, is bending to pressure from lobbyists and things like that. If you're on one of these advisory boards, not only do you get to see documents that you and I can't see, but you don't get to see even the lobbying efforts by those people after they see the documents. That's shielded. So you're creating a special class of Washington, D.C. insiders that is exempt from the very laws that affect the rest of us, not only in terms of what we have access to, but what we have access to in terms of their lobbying efforts. These trade agreements are like a democracy free zone. Uh, the uh, lead negotiator and actor for the U.S. is now working for AbbVie pharmaceutical company. The uh, lead negotiator on the IP chapter for the TPP chapter is now working for the Motion Picture Association in Brussels, Stan McCoy. Uh, you know, we have this problem in, the, in, in, in you know, all over Washington, D.C. This is a big problem. It's a disgrace. And what's happening to us right now uh, is, 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 is a reflection of the level of corruption that we see right now in Washington, D.C., and the amount of corporate power you see in Europe. Now, as it relates to the, uh, I want to talk about one substantive issue, and that's the uh, three-step test and the burden thing. <clears throat> uh, the three-step test is a, an attempt to have a legal provision which regulates and limits exceptions that governments can do on copyright. The origins of this was in 1967, and in sort of a convoluted history, it was actually, could reasonably be described as an expansion of the flexibility of governments to issue exceptions, because they took about a dozen areas where the Byrne Convention had carved out special areas where you can create exceptions, like quotations, news of the day, public affairs, certain compulsory license of music, things that were established as free areas where countries could, uh, could roll back rights and create user rights and create exceptions. Education was another area. And they said if somebody's not covered by any of those burn exceptions, you can also, as it relates to this reproduction right, you can also, in addition to whatever else you can do, you can create exceptions if they meet the step. And, and I'm going to read not from the Byrne Convention, but the way the WTO then uh, unfortunately repeated this language. But not not a, not a, but but also it turns out in the spirit of the bird, which was was it could be interpreted as, a, as an expansion of flexibility. It says members shall confine limitations or exceptions to exclusive rights. In now first test is in certain special cases. So that's the first test. Is it a special case? Number two, does it with it do not conflict with the normal exploitation exp exploitation of the work. So the second test you have to say is, does the exception conflict with the normal expo exploitation of the work? Well, that's actually a pretty tough test if you take it literally, but it also depends on who's making that judgment. You can have an exception which conflicts with what would normally, normally be the way a person would commercialize a work. Um, uh, you can imagine, but according to this, you know, it, it, 
No, you can't. I mean, it says it cannot conflict with the normal expectation of the work. I mean, that's if you take that literally, as as like a, an absolute test, not balanced by the other provisions. It's a very difficult test to make as people develop uh, uh, more and more granular ways of charging for information, for example, and licensing information. And then finally it says, and do not unreasonably prejudice the legitimate interest of the right holder. Well, there's a lot loaded up there. You have unreasonably, what's prejudice, what's legitimate. There's a, a different three-step test that exists in the same agreement uh, for patents, and it includes the interest of third parties. Uh, that's not included in this copyright thing in the WTO. And there's another one for trademarks, which is even more balanced. But the, I think legally the important thing is that the WTO has ruled that this only applied in cases where the Berne Convention did not already provide a separate set of exceptions. And it does not extend to things which are not part of the WTO agreement uh, or uh, are, are rights that are not sort of spelled out in other agreements. It's sort of a not as bad as it sounds in some ways. It doesn't apply to any exception you do. It just applies to certain, and it's nuanced, it's technical. But why is it important? Well, this is the basically the high-level regulation of democracy. This is the high-level regulation of when can you roll back copyright. That means that you can't just have like a vote in your Congress to say, I want to create an exception for the X, Y, or Z in copyright. You have to be regulated by some external foreign trade organization that'll tell you whether or not what they what what citizens want to do now that's that's bad enough but what's happened to TPP in addition to wanting or the TTIP in addition to wanting to have new language which now extends to the burn exceptions and doesn't include the moderated language necessarily that you find in some subsequent agreements such as the Beijing agreement uh, or the the uh, 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 the, uh, the 1996 digital copyright agreements, which, which had helpful language to kind of moderate the effect of some of these languages. Not only is it sort of, in terms of what we may expect to uh, come out of these secret negotiations from the people that, you know, one day they work for the government, the next day they work for the motion picture industry. Uh, they want to make these, these decisions about what's unreasonable and legitimate. They want those things decided not by government to government dispute resolution, but by giving investors the right to litigate these things in investor state provisions. They want Viacom and Disney to be able to bring an action before private arbitrators and levy fines against the United States of America if the liberties you have to use their uh, films and music for personal use on a web page or on a Facebook or something like that. Uh, violates this test, and then they want to charge millions of dollars, if not more, uh, the taxpayers have to pay, and which puts pressures on, on governments to roll back user rights. So, yeah, are we concerned about that? Yeah, we're concerned about that. We think this is something worth paying attention to. I think you should lawyer up a bit before you have these kind of contracts signed. I think you should have really, really good lawyers take a look at this stuff. And the fact that governments haven't been super aggressive in the past in enforcing these provisions in government to government, that's because the governments all have exceptions in their backyard. There's a limit to what the EU and the United States or Japan is going to file against the US. They have complex relationships and they have their own exceptions. Viacom and Disney, they don't have that kind of world complicated view. They have very, very narrow interest. And if they can enforce these provisions through investor state agreement, they're going to be aggressive, and they're going to make you feel the pain. You're screwing yourself with this agreement. If you do it, you're creating a standard that you're going to lose. The exception is going to be rolled back. It's going to hurt everybody in this room. It's going to hurt every classroom teacher. These are a bad idea. Anyway, we don't like the IP in the agreement. We're opposed to it. Thank you. Great. Well, so thank you.